Kevin Match. Qu'est-ce que c'est Today, as you all know, that we are here to present Dr. K. M. Munchi Nabila Lakshya. To give you a background of this lecture series and also to introduce the speaker, may I now request Chairman of Bhartavitya Bodh Bhagavad Gita, Sri K. G. Raghavan, to come to the dais. Before that, I would like to say the hall that we have assembled here, there is a, has a significance to Mr. Raghavan and to the Bhavan. The photo that you see there is uh, Justice K.G. Gopi Olavayana, the father of uh, Mr. K.G. Raghavan. Give a big round of applause because he, he is the one who and his family took the initiative of reconstructing this hall to present the series of lectures, music concerts, dances, and many other cultural programs in this very beautiful auditorium. So this, uh, we have his uh, blessings, Justice Gopi blessings, and uh, we have Mr. Raghavan here, and family members of Raghavan is here, and their somebody's and wonderful gathering is here in the morning, and I see a lot of uh, dignitaries from the legal fraternity. So I take this very opportunity to welcome each one and all of you very heartily to this lecture program. And uh, may I request K.J. Raghavan to please introduce our very distinguished speaker. And you know all Mr. Venkatramani ji is here. Big round of applause to him. Despite his very busy schedule, when yesterday night we met him at the airport, I can't say no to Raghavan, so I am here. That is the love and affection and the care that he has got and regards for Mr. Raghavan. So he is here. He will probably welcome. Same words was used when Justice Savindran was uh, met. We asked him to preside over it. I can't say no to Raghavan. This is a, a story all through. I'm not trying to prize in front of you all Raghavan. Not necessary at all. Not that he won't care for all this. But what happened, actually, I had to report you. So this is the love and affection and the bonding which uh, our chairman has with uh, the uh, wonderful speakers of the dais. And also of the dais, I see you. Very, very good people here. And I'm sure that each one of you will enjoy the presentation. Bama Knights, ladies and gentlemen, this is indeed a very important occasion for the Bharati Vidyabhavan for more than one reason. This is the Dr. K. Munshi Memorial Lecture. As you know, Dr. Munshi was a founder of Bharati Vidyabhavan, which he founded in 1936 with the blessings of Mahatma Gandhi and Sardar Vallabhai Patel. To Dr. Munshi, Mahatma Gandhi was his spiritual guru and Sardar Vallabhai Patel was his political. He realized that mere getting political independence to India was not sufficient. India's from every side. In addition, Dr. Munshiji put a second basis for the Bhavan, Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, truth, devotion, and beauty. And add to this the glorious statement, Amritam to Vidya, knowledge is nectar. And it is on this basis that the Bharati Vidya Bhavan was founded. And he gave to this institution the name of Bharati Vidya, which is a very meaningful name that he chose. For Bharati Vidya does not have frontiers. It has no caste. It has no community. It has no religion. It has no race. It is universal in character. And to Dr. Munshi, Bharati Vidya Bhavan was the living embodiment of the statement of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. To him, the statement standard children who have passed out of the school due to technology, just across in the same building. And that is meant to provide computer education free of cost to all those who cannot afford a computer education in a sophisticated institute. And 
we have had over 5,000 children who have passed out of these schools, of our computer technologies, provides for computer education to the senior citizens. Special training at our computer technology school, providing them education on how to use computer technology for basic requirements of day to day. And we, and we have received such wonderful responses from them. All of them have acknowledged that the sense of loneliness is vanishing because they are now able to communicate with their family wherever they are. Then we have the Gandhi Institute of Science and Moral Education. This is basically for the purpose of to emphasize that the essence of a civilized society is good governance. And without good governance, there is going to be chaos. There is going to be complete breakdown of law and order. And having regard to the fact that Dr. K. M. Munshi was himself one of the architects of the Indian constitution, he was a member of the drafting committee of the constitution set up by the Constituent Assembly. He worked with Dr. Ambedkar, Saraladi, and Sri V. Gopal Somaiyar. And to Dr. Munshi, in his own words, every letter of the Constitution breeds good governance. And every aspect of what is stated in the Indian Constitution is to provide for what is called as good governance. And that is the relevance of having this institute under the name of K. Munshi Institute for Good Governance. Ladies and gentlemen, I have now given you a brief bird's eye view of the activities of the Bharati Vidya Bhavan at Bangalore. Now today, we have with us Mr. R. Venkatramani to deliver the K. Munshi Memorial Lecture, which is one of the most important activities of Bharati Vidya Bhavan. Mr. Venkatramani has been an advocate practicing in the Supreme Court as a senior advocate for now over 45 years. He is one of the long, one of the most long-standing senior counsels in the adorns the position of the Attorney General of India. <laughs> Sir, we welcome you heartily, and we could not have found a better person to deliver the Munshi Memorial Lecture. And when I asked him what the subject, he said, there's one subject that I'm passionate about. That is the role of an Indian citizen. And today, in the modern world, that role has acquired a totally different meaning. And you will hear all that from Sri Venkatramani. I'm, I have to also mention the presence of Mrs. Venkatramani. And I will thank you for coming here with him. And we acknowledge your presence. We have with us to preside over this function, Honorable Justice R.V. Ravindran, former Judge of the Supreme Court of India, and he needs no introduction to the audience here. He has been one of the most respected judges of the Honorable Supreme Court after a long stint as a judge of the Karnataka High Court and as Chief Justice of the Madhya Pradesh High Court. And we are extremely grateful to him for having accepted to preside over this very important event. I heartily welcome all the judges of the High Court who are here with us, and it shows your keenness to know what the views of the attorney is on such an important subject as this, and importantly, your affection and love for the Bharati in welcoming all of you I rest and invite Sri R. Venkatramani to deliver the K. Munshi Memorial Lecture on the subject of new dimensions of Indian citizenship. Thank you very much. Before we request you to please deliver the letter, we would like to honor you with all our love and affection. I request. Mrs. 
Thank you, everybody, also to be here. Please join us. You say, you know, we are seeing your wedding reception. Please come. <laughs> we missed that, so we are here. So may I request Justice Ravindran and Raghun to please honor them, please. I don't claim uh, any wisdom and scholarship beyond the reach of many of my good friends here and judges, honorable judges, except that the love and affection of Mr. Raghavan brought me here. If that's a qualification for me to give you lecture, then I abide by that. <laughs> Public lectures like this have their importance in, in many senses. I recollect uh, two or three of them in the morning as I was uh, two or three of them in the morning as I was uh, trying to reflect on the subject which I chose for discussion. Tickle about whether to talk on the motivation which scientists have for uh, as a reason for the pursuits of science, whether it's truth or beauty. He had this skepticism about talking on the subject. Then he says in his introduction uh, to the lecture, an important uh, statement, which is a perturbation from the Chancellor of the University. And this is what the Chancellor of the University tells him and which is quoted, I quote, the purpose of the lecture series is to stimulate the students, is to stimulate the students' abilities in order to enable him to appreciate the excellence of a work and to induce him to an attempt to produce good things himself with a hope. He talks like those of us who are acquainted with how a wonderful human brain is something probably is the most unique among the species. So he talks about the billions of neurons which constitute the brain and the connections. And uh, he says these neurons are the basic structure of the brain. So I always try to connect the basic structure of the brain and the basic structure of a nation. The neurons are the people of this country and we are the basic structure of a country. All of the features, Keshavan and Dabardi, are the, are the intellectual products of this base. Light and mind. Not because I am going to say something beyond what you may be knowing. And not because I will be in a position to produce matter. As I said, uh, I could say no to Mr. Raghavan. And the great temptation was that if under the auspice of Bharati Vidya Bhavan, one could stimulate oneself. So it is a personal satisfaction for myself which brought me here. So if I can stimulate myself into some of the most intricate issues which are confronting our contemporary life of the nation, 
I thought, let me try to do that. And you can pardon me for, uh, you know, taking it upon as a simulation for myself. But I suppose in the course of this discussion, if uh, we're able to capture, peep into, if even briefly, into the great mind of Mr. Munshi. One of his books he has written in a wide range of literature, Ramayana, Mahabharata, all those characters, you know, the beautiful way he has uh, written about each one of them. But uh, one of his, when I went through that uh, collection of lectures, I found it was not, I think it was not deep. I would propose to read a couple of paragraphs from one of those lectures to set the tone for my little peep into Bharatiya Vidya. And if Bharatiya Vidya is, a, is I understand, is like a bhavan like this, is not a place, is not a place in the physical sense, it is an idea, a thought. So Vidya, Bharatiya Vidya is an idea and a thought when because of its perennial appeal and its content and its roots. And so it's called Bharatiya Vidya. And when it's many of us would like to talk about the pride of India, may say so for different reasons. And when different reasons may sometimes uh, coalesce and congregate, again we have all kinds of debates on the pride of India being spoken. or non-violence at any cost. And uh, reservations with Kulapati Munshi had occasion to differ with Gandhiji and the exchange of letters between them, a remarkable uh, exchange of uh, thoughts and ideas, as remarkable as there was one would pick up from a faraway United States of America between uh, uh, Harold Lasky and Jessel Holmes their Holmes, Lasky letters and the great introduction by Justice Frank Perter, a great piece of literature. I try to compare this exchange between Gandhiji and Kulupati Munshi and the other genre of literature. The underlying idea is if two minds, which may often seem to be in unison, but may have occasions to differ, and how do you differ? And the way of differing a disagreement and a civilized and uh, way of refined way of disagreement, I think is what ultimately constitutes the refinement of civilization being a human being. So let me read uh, this paragraph from Atan Hindustan. His form, I would be in a position to uh, retain your attention. Before I do that, Institutions, uh, the way they have grown in our country. <coughs> I'm not talking about the post-constitutional, post-independence period. Whatever be they are, <coughs> whether the educational institutions, formally, informally. So our country has a tradition of informal institutional functioning, which is an oral transmission of ideas and cultures and, and then knowledge and wisdom. This informal communication system, to a large extent which thrived over a period of time, is now on a decline. So the formal structure of communication and transmission of knowledge has uh, to a large extent overtaken and substituted the informal systems of communication of knowledge and wisdom. Is there a problem there? Is there a need to revive <coughs> the informal systems of transmission of knowledge and wisdom and if so, within what framework of acceptability and uh, success? It's a question which keeps coming to mind when you look at the way our um, legal education is uh, structured. 
the way legal education is uh, tried to be connected to administration of justice and the way our current system of administration of justice, namely an overarching adversarial system. So in this, the informal way of transmitting values, knowledge, and wisdom is there a role for their revival? And if so, how do we really build them into our current formal systems of communication and transmission of knowledge and wisdom? So while that may seem to be completely unconnected to the subject of my discussion, but I think there is something which we need to look at. Because after all, to take a few again from Ramachandran's statement about uh, neurons being the basic structure of the brain, <coughs> so every, every element of an input which comes into my mind, whether by way of perception, whether by way of being told, or the, whether even unconsciously receiving anything which the mind can receive, all that goes into the making of a human mind. So if that all that goes to making of a human mind, and if that is a fundamental substratum of a well-oiled and well-ordered social organization, I think there is there will always be a role for an informal and uh, highly evolved system and way of transmission of knowledge and wisdom. <coughs> We talk about globalized world today. <coughs> Globalization, authors who write from different perspectives. You write from an economical perspective, well, you have a certain understanding of globalization. <coughs> if you talk from an international law or an international, very equal point of view of the importance of civilization and the unique contribution that each civilization the West, the East, etc. And given two important uh, differences, the way peoples in different civilizations have thought about, like the Chinese and the Indian way of thought is very different from how the Western thought came. The wonderful marriage between the moral element in each and every one of us and the transformation of the moral element in each and every one of us into legal thoughts, into other political or other thoughts, this marriage, I think, is important. So while the, in jurisprudence, we have been told about either the disconnect or the connect between law and morality, the heart fuller debate in jurisprudence about law and morality and so on and so forth, that discussion goes on even today. So between natural law and positivism and all schools of positivism, the exclusion positivism, the inclusive positivism, so on and so forth. At the bottom of it all, I find uh, something very interesting. The, the reach of uh, every thinker to find out whether morality has a role to play at all in any aspect of our life, including law and the Constitution, or morality will have a secondary aspect because there is no commonly accepted morality or notions of morality. Very interesting debate even contemporarily happening across the globe. All these things, as, as a practitioner of law in Supreme Court, and uh, I find when you walk in the court and walk out of the court every day, what is happening in a court is not merely uh, a dispute resolution process, a case being resolved by judges who are, you know, a very heightened sense of doing justice. The court is a mirror of the society. The, the unresolved issues, which could not be resolved elsewhere, march slowly up to this place and uh, seek resolution. Therefore, in a sense, our courts are mirrors and to the issues arising every day in, in the midst of our community and uh, either our ability or our inability to resolve them in one way or the other. So these are thoughts which keep coming to our mind while looking at and evaluating or, or even diagnosing the systems of uh, various systems of law today and their relevance to contribution to fundamental notions of uh, being uh, a good uh, human being. That's where Bharatiya Vidya comes in. 
So, and when I tried to bring about some element of connection between our Bharatiya Vidya, which we call otherwise by the wonderful, a very slender expression called Dharma, I tried to connect it, uh, Dharma as Bharatiya Vidya and uh, our constitution. Um, how do we go about it? And that is the reason when uh, Mr. Uh, Raghavan asked me to choose a subject, this idea just came out, popped out of my head as uh, something as a natural consequence of my engagement uh, in with law uh, over a long period of time. So let me try to read out. I may walk in and walk out of my printed speech, uh, subject to your permission, and uh, uh, like, a, like a little footnote or a commentary, as the case may be. Our planet Earth is one special place for life to emerge, evolve, and sustain, maybe among many such places dotting the infinite universe. Culture is a treasure trove of each community of humans and a product of the peculiar features of life, knowledge, philosophy, and religion. On the one level, culture is a special species of collective property to be owned and transmitted within the community, and on a different level, it is enriched by encounters with other cultures. In essence, migrations of minds, their minglings and merges, as part of migrations of people, has been and will be the perennial connecting thread of knowledge and civilization. The realization that no path of inquiry or no system of knowledge is final or that no faith or religion is superior can come and constantly remain with us only if there is a free migrations and mingling of minds. The literatures of bhakti poetry in India of Sufi mystics elsewhere, the great Rumi, for example, or illustrations of exalted mind sharing noble thoughts as against battles, killings, and divisions. Divisions are born out of ignorance, claim for hegemony, and fear of extinction. Maybe Darwin can give an explanation about this. History tells us that the two great Abrahamic faiths fought against each other in Europe over a long period because of these, among other reasons, which seem to haunt us even today. The lawyer denominations of a nature cling too strong with ignorance and fear. Education in the wider sense liberates us from these two clutches. Speaking of education, Rousseau says this, I quote, plants are shaped by cultivation and men by education. If men were born big and strong, his size and strength would be useless to him until he had learned to make use of them. They would be detrimental to him in that they would keep others from thinking of aiding him. And abandoned to himself, he would die of want before knowing his need. And childhood is taken to be a pitiable state. It is not seen that the human race would have perished if human had not begun as a child. We are born weak and we need strength. We are born totally unprovided, we need aid. We are born stupid, we need judgment. Everything we do not have at our birth and which we need to have, which we need when we are grown is given to us by education. This education comes to us from a nature or from men or from things. The internal development of our faculties and our organs is the education of nature. The use that we are taught to make is the development of the education of men. And what we acquire from our experience about the objects which affect us is the education of things. I think it's a very profound statement. And um, the fact that comes from, a, from across the West, I think, did not be a, a reason why we need not accept it. It is said that culture is often developed by confronting their past, projecting it, recovering it, which made us what we are in the world today and will make us what we want to be in the world of tomorrow. Its vitality has been shaping attitudes, discipline, and approaches to life to suit new conditions age after age as vigorously in the past as in the present. Judges talk about a living constitution. The foundation is the ageless culture of Shraddha, faith, Samyama, self-restraint, and Samarpana, dedication, blossoming into Satyam, Shivam, and Sundaram. For these values, our forefathers lived and died. So did Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Swami Dayananda, Swami Ramatirtha, Swami Vekananda, Sri Ramana Mahadi, Sri Aravindra, Mahatma Gandhi, and some more. I quote, before I reach out to the content, contemporary issues of citizenship in a global domain such as religion, faith, or language, are now exposed 
to the demands of accommodation, adjustment, and understanding, and in ways that are laid down in the Constitution and laws. As Voltaire wrote in 1756, three things exercised constant influence over the minds of men, climate, government, and religion. Quote, All the three of them are candidates for good citizenship, more so when everything about them seems to be locked in controversy. Where does the Indian idea of dharma lie in this bewildering play of many forces? Can we weave a comfortable fabric blending the vast sea of constitutional ideas and the rich heritage of perennial wisdom of a dharma literature? Dr. Munshi thought that culture and civilization are two different matters. The word civilization is a colonial and hegemonical mindset. Our concept of dharma is beyond the narrow idea of civilization, born of superior ideas of conduct and ways of life. It's grounded in understanding non-injurious ways of life, non-injurious to the human and material universe, which is what we call sustainable development today after having charted out an uncharted voyage of economic development. Today's civilizational aspirations are encapsulated in human rights dialogue, which are themselves product of extremes of race, nation, and all the divisive factors of the Cold War between socialist claims to build a new social order and capitalist responses. These dialogues seem to occupy in this place spaces and fields otherwise occupied by other grand ideas and practice of life practiced over centuries. Almost all ancient legal codes from Hammurabi to Manu were the mixture of dealing with material world matters and connecting with the creator and moral persuasion. That we do not fall in line with some of those worn out thoughts or codes of conduct or a hierarchical social order does not make a difference as regards the fundamental persuasion to seek meanings and orderly ways of life. The Indian idea of dharma has no parallel in other systems of thoughts or philosophy. Great Indian minds from the Upanishadic scribes to contemporary thinkers such as Dr. Radhakrishnan and, and seers and saints the Arabindu or Bhagavan Ramana have contemplated on the width of dharma and how it pervades the universe in action and how it animates human mind. Shri K. Munshi himself writes, for many years and repeatedly I have tried to discover the true meaning of Indian culture. The ancients call this culture dharma, which meant to them the sum total of all sentiments, beliefs, values, ideals, and activities, which made life worth living and literature and country worth living. This culture, however, is to be found in the sense of continuity, in the consciousness of Indian unity in the permanent values in which the Indians have always seen the fulfillment of life, in the ethical and idealistic absolutes which have molded the Indian outlook on the eternal questions. What is life? What is purpose and end? Thought equally is not culture, nor is knowledge by itself. Culture consists of a certain value which are found to express themselves through rituals and myths, through modes of life and canons of conduct, through social traditions and institutions, through modes of expression in language and literature, through theories and ideals of life, through all the social, emotional, and ideal factors which make a society a distinctive living organism. I digress here for a minute. Marx wrote in his uh, Communist Manifesto, the specter of communism is haunting Europe at some point of time. And one of his famous pieces, these philosophers have hitherto only you know, uh, thought about the world, but the point, however, is to ch change it. From interpretation of the world to changing the world was what uh, Marx's great uh, um, future is course of action for civilization. But one important question comes, who will be the harbingers of change? With all their good intentions and political experimenters, with all their good intentions, will probably hit a roadblock at some point or the other. And what's that roadblock? Is it uh, the innate uh, uh, tendencies of human nature or something so unformidable or formidable about human nature that you cannot uh, transform it, or the very prospect of transforming human nature is something beyond human ability and competence. These are fundamental ethical, moral, and philosophical questions, which I think uh, no political philosopher would be in a position to answer. But then we are in a world of politics, and uh, politics is informing our constitution, and our constitution is being woven out of a large number of political ideas and, and then dialogues. So that's where like uh, we are either on the one level seems to be a technology of uh, V.S. Ramachandran, citizens being the basic structure of a nation. Let me say, continue to read it. 
Belonging to a community, a nation, or a country today is vastly different from what it was, say, a century ago, when the domestic frontier, the domestic life matters were different and cloistered. The quiet Indian scene did not engage the self and colonial geographical conquers of, of the rest of the world. Long before the colonial entry into India, it had become part of world heritage by sharing its philosophy and inquiry, culture, and other treasures of its higher pursuits, including science by the sheer strength of their appeal. India did not have to struggle to be a nation like Germany before Bismarck. It has seen the rise and fall of kings and empires. It has quietly witnessed battles and victories and losses. Like all the human vanities elsewhere, it has seen empire-building ambitions of dynasties. But it has unified itself by fundamental philosophical and spiritual inquiry and the quest for knowing the world, life, and the secrets of the universe. It bears testimony to the transmission and sharing of its truths and visions across languages and regions, peoples and places. The thousands of architecturally marvelous temples and their signs are standing examples of the sharing and transmission, assimilation and adjustment. That is not a geographically drawn country as European region where it did not matter. Its roots are strong, vibrant, perennial, and youth will only be reasonable with open doors and unclosed windows. Open doors and unclosed windows. Dharma has thus informed the humble Indian mind to be both a sharer and a recipient unique in his internal march towards truth and beauty. It is in a special national canvas that we need to discuss and talk about citizenship. I do not propose to talk about general citizenship virtues that are described in textbooks through matters, though matters such as freedom from corruption and freedom from debasing human conduct in public and private life or entering our criminal courts of citizenship. On the other hand, we cannot talk about citizenship quest without talking about the Constitution. The great twist with building our future came through this newborn child called the Constitution. The idea of Constitution is deeply ingrained in the human psyche. The Constitution is our citizenship vimana. But how to make our Constitution, our dharmic vehicle, and dharma our constitutional companion? This question is important as we need to unravel and dig deep into a civilizational potential, the great past, to navigate diversity and distinctions without clashes and collapse. The future-looking dimensions of rule of law may also inform the fabric of our citizenship. Again, digressing for a minute, we heard from the best for a long period of time, rule of law means having certain you know, uh, con contours or features, like an independent judiciary, democracy, and uh, uh, representative democracy, and an independent judiciary in which neither law nor executive will intrude and so on and so forth. So post-1948, we had a large number of dialogues tracing rule of law to Magna Carta and so on and so forth. But I suppose that's a very, a very limited edition version of rule of law. With the emergence of uh, contemporary demand for all the peoples across the globe on claims of equality and equal regard for all, we have new unraveled dimensions of the rule of law. I think uh, we'll probably talk about it sooner or later. I reserve that subject for a later day discussion. Our daily lives are not secluded affairs. Our homes are not private spaces. Within homes, you are withdrawn into the chosen world of navigation through the internet and cyberspace, that, and that space diverts us. Our spaces in the external world is entangled with matters and issues that call for constant accommodation or estrangement. Our religions constantly collide with questions and challenges which are legitimized under the Constitution for our ideological criticism. Our inclination to deal with other treasures of our past, namely language or culture, are told to be subject to restraints not ceded by us. I think we create excuses for erecting walls of separation built on fences of yesterday, forgetting to ask why should fragile graves of yesterday built on ignorance and petty intolerances rule us today. Thomas Paine, in his uh, uh, great uh, book, talked about uh, being ruled. Life. What you do from getting up from bed and what you do on a food chain or a workplace 
transport, and even the choice of dresses. The bedroom is hardly a private space, while many still do not have rooms for their beds. So comes the question, what's our free domains of choices and free management of being a citizen? And when you talk about it, are we talking about only those fortunate few at the higher echelons of society, or we are talking about those who are continued to be in the deprived domains of being you know, the, the lesser part of a society? Citizenship is made meaningful by the active choices we are called upon to make, and uh, citizenship is uh, full of dialogue and compromise because the choices towards our thoughts and actions we make impact every other. Are there unbridgeable disagreements? If so, what together resolves need to be coined to ease disagreements and removes away from dissolving fractions. The new coalition between Dharma as its own deep inner ways of life to be in equal regard of all life as the animating guide of all our thoughts and deeds. And the idea of constitution as the participatory path to reinforce this equal regard I see as one of the emerging contours of citizenship. I think instead of market or global factor determining how we live, what we need or consume, we should decide, accept or reject. Sustainable development is not what the rest of the world will decide for us. It should be what we can decide for ourselves. And this decision has to be an integral part of a citizenship agenda. Political writer Dalton Russell titled his 2008 publication, The Good Citizen, How a Younger Generation is Reshaping American Politics. The reviewer of the book makes the following observations. I quote, thinkers of all types and political learning, scholars, television pundits, and writers tell us that India, that today's youth are politically lazy and indifferent. They do not vote, and they appear to be more interested in the release of the newest iPod than being the kind of citizen that made up previous generations in this country's history. Young people today are putting America's democracy as us is the message we hear. Dalton Howard insists that we must stop focusing only on negative changes and see that in fact our public and our politics are changing and many of these changes are producing positive outcomes and additionally in a welcome turn Dalton breaks with much of the America of his literature by including a significant if small comparative section looking at what is happening in regard to the political process in other advanced industrial democracies. He begins by asking what does it mean to be a good citizen in America today? This is a very smart adjustment as it remedies the logic of concluding that citizens are behaving differently than they did 50 years ago, our society must be in peril. Dalton lets us on his conclusions up front. He claims that what we have changed are the norms of citizenship. He argues that where the obligations, loyalty, deference to authority, and the subject mentality were the defining characteristics of a good citizen throughout the first half of the 20th century, a norm Dalton calls a duty-based citizenship from the 1960s on, where the new art of trace increasingly constituted citizenship norms. The new norms were the engaged citizenship, promote a more direct approach to government affairs, increase tolerance, and concern for the well-being of others, and not only in the US, but globally. I wish to explain this very optimistic statement to the author. Before I endeavor to do that, I must make some preliminary statements. Our institutions of higher learning have opened up a wide range of cross-sections of the community towards pursuit of knowledge, social transformation, and both women and men of humble origins asserting to equality and positions of social influence. Competing with other branches of knowledge, the study of law has begun to legitimately lay claim to new debates and discourses, virtually concerning all and every aspect of life. While the doors to higher learning are opening up, questions of individual fulfillment and well-being, the relevance of pursuing the study and practice of law, as well as certain other branches of knowledge have also come under serious critique. For many, the future is an uncertain proposition. We as a nation, endeavoring to enrich and enhance the democracy or in the process of effecting a unique assimilation and integration of a native knowledge system, native knowledge system. Think technology has given us freedom to express and communicate without any control by owners of tools of expression. Social media is the highest tool of free expression, but human nature is yet to know the highest levels of its use. Since moral persuasions are pushed to the backstage, only legal control and police state are seen as the regulatory choices. Is this the road ahead? It is yet to know the highest levels of its use. The challenges are immense, and we do not have a model available in a copybook fashion 
that can be replicated with a few twists here and a few turns there. It appears to me that just as India is engaged with our own experiments in truth and creating a fulfilling social order, every community and groups of people elsewhere are engaged in their own way in the quest for a fulfilling social order where individual autonomy informed by a deep sense of responsibility would be zealously promoted as a foundational value. Steven Pinker in his The Better Angels of His Nature, The Decline of Violence in History and Discourses, asserts convincingly that violence has unquestionably declined in the maintenance of social order and dealing with individual liberty and autonomy. He says the decline of violence will be the most significant and the least appreciated development in the history of a species. Let us see what he has got to say further. Human nature as evolution left it is not up to the challenge of getting, up in, uh, getting us into the blessedly peaceful cell in the upper left corner of the matrix. Motives like greed, fear, dominance, and lust keep drawing us towards aggression. And through a major workaround, the threat of tit for tat vengeance has the potential to bring about cooperation if the game is re repeat. In practice, it's, it's calibrated by self-serving biases and often results in cycles of feuding rather than stable deterrence. But human nature also contains motives to climb into the peaceful cell such as sympathy and self-control. It includes channels of communication, such as language, and is equipped with an open-ended system of combinatorial reasoning. When this system is refined in the crucible of debate and its products are accumulated through literacy and the forms of cultural memory, it can think of ways of challenging, changing the payoff structure, and make the peaceful cell increasingly attractive. And I think I'm reminded of the, the Tower of Babel cable in Bible, I suppose, uh, the Tower of Babel is a matter of history. We would be, with a combination of all these forces that Stephen Pinker are talking about, can build a new Tower of Babel and uh, with a welcome hand of the Creator welcoming us forever. And I think that's the way ahead. The Republic of Plato, like the Bhagavad Gita, is a great attempt at exploration of the entire spectrum of life. The individual, her morality, the structure of a community, and the virtues and vices of rulers. Republic is Plato's painstaking, painstaking attempt to define in non-abstract terms how the attainment of happiness or living the good life, as the Greeks would have said. In other words, how can an individual fulfill himself or herself? And from this point of view, Republic is apparently not a manifesto of political philosophy. As Robin Waterfield translating Plato says, he invites us as we read to use features of the community he constructs as a map or a key to understanding our, our own psyche. We understand that an individual is a complex and consists of a range of needs, not all of which are concerned with mere existence. In the domain of individuals' interactions in fulfillment or satisfaction of the unlimited supply of mental wants and desires, we threaten one another's integrity. It is this conflict area which poses the eternal challenge to the genius of the human mind. What are the mechanisms, principles, and precepts that we can possibly create and practice to deal with the intense conflict areas particularly under the umbrella of constitution. I venture to say that the concept of citizenship is the ability to comprehend the duality of individuals versus the community and the potential to search for means to resolve this duality. It appears to me that Robin Waterfield is as closer to the understanding when he says Plato's republic, purpose in republic then is to provide a kind of unified defeat theory in which all the elements which make human life good are tied together in a version of eternal unity, orderliness, and stability. Dharma and constitution can be our unified field theory. Writing soon thereafter, in 350 BC, in his equally at instructive treatise, Politics, Aristotle observed, I quote, he would, inquire into the, he would inquire into the essence and attributes of various kinds of governments, governments first, must first of all determine what is a state. But a state is a composite, like any other old made up of many parts. These are the citizens who compose it. It's evident that, therefore, so we must begin by asking, who is a citizen, and what's the meaning of the term? Aristotle spoke like a typical lawyer, fascinated by the urge to define. A scientist defines the terms of his work and inquires into newer definitions of the universe, whether the DNA or the Higgins boson. A lawyer also defines, but perhaps in a different way, not for the purpose of assertion of unqualified truths, but for statement of purposes, tools, and instrumentalities. A lawyer, by the definition, defines the processes. What did Aristotle say further about the citizen in a democracy? He who has the power to take part in the deliberative or judicial administration of any state is said by us to be citizens of the state, and speaking generally, a state is a body of citizens suffixing for the purpose of life. I quote, 
whether the virtue of a good man and a good citizen is the same or not. So before entering on this discussion, the circular first obtain some general notions of the virtue of a citizen. Like a sailor, the citizen is a member of a community. Now sailors have different functions, or one of them is rover, another a pilot, a third lookout, a third lookout man, a fourth is described by some similar terms, and well the precise definition applicable to them all. For they all of them have a common object, which is safety in navigation. Similarly, one citizen differs from another, but the salvation of the community is the common business of them all. This community is a constitution, the virtue of the citizen will therefore be relative to the constitution of which he is a member, though Aristotle was not speaking of a constitution in contemporary terms. There is a serious problem in suggesting the salvation of the community is the common business of them all. It sounds almost like the resolution of the individual and the worship of dictatorship. The Stalin and Mao, rather lesser heroes, preaching on the virtues of a new social order as both the ends and the means. But perhaps Aristotle had something else in mind. He probably talks about the community as the framework within which the individual is born and lives in the framework which constantly transforms itself. I understand it's very hard to define the subtle and the real relations between the individual and the community that constitutes the meaning of citizenship, especially in contemporary times. Attributes and the constitution of great integration of the two wheels of our citizenship carriers. Within our Kautilya's Arthashastra, which is said to be a science of politics and concerning the art of government in the wider sense, a very close look at the Kautilya treatise shows how ultimately the Raja Dharma is founded in Lokakshema, or the welfare of the people. The fine blend of citizenship and governance can be seen. The sequence would be incomplete if it did not catch. authority has in fact supplemented and contradicted Dharma Shastra where it seemed necessary in the public interest. The academic effort of bringing legislation to alignment with the Shastra was contemplated by Medhatiti among others. But the method chosen as we'll see was to argue that the Shastra contemplated only such legislation as its own silence is rendered necessary and that only provided that Vedic authority and valid custom knew nothing to the contrary. Digressing here again, I remembered our story narrated in a book called titled uh, Essays in uh, uh, Jewish Philosophy. The story is about uh, imaginative King Khazia and the encounter with Alexander. So in the kingdom of Khazia, two families discover a treasure trove in their land. So they were not clear as to what do we do with the treasure trove. All treasure troves belong to the king, but they were discovered in their own fields. And um, they take the issue to the court. And, and uh, that's the time when King Alexander is also available. And um, so King Khazia tells them, uh, asks them about them, and says, what are you? They say, we are neighbors. And he says, um, so each of you will plates and everything's full of gold. The Alexander asks him, what is that you're going to serve us? He says it's because of the rains that come down in our country and the kind of dharma we practice you saw today morning that there are rains in our country and we live by this, this uh, precept. And um, Alexander understood the message with values. I prefer to use the word dharma use instead of morality as the former expression has wider connotations. However, the issue as to individual autonomy and the role of the state in protecting and promoting such autonomy as a value in itself was not found to be necessary because 
when both the individual and the state pursue their aims by reason of dharma, no conflict exists. And again, another story comes to our mind. Uh, we have a, a great Tamil uh, epic called uh, Selapadikaram, like Mahabharata and Ramayana, a lot of such stories. And that's the beauty of these, you know, our epics and Puranas. The king goes in the evening to have a light, uh, you know, the, uh, the lamps lighted in the evening in the temple. The lamps would not uh, be lighted. And uh, the king turns his minister and asks, uh, Mr. Minister, would I have done anything unconsciously wrong that the lamps in our country do not burn today? The highest sense of a dharmic, you know, of universal truth. This question is a question which has bothered people throughout the ages regardless of the differences in perspectives and worldviews, perceptions and worldviews. The attempts to answer human predicament concerning the innate conflicts between governance and citizenship have passed through two models. The socialist model which believed on complete external regulation of all human context has placed superior wisdom in the capacity of the state to govern. A liberated segment of people will have all the knowledge and authority to discover determine and prescribe all codes of human conduct to be followed by the rest of the community. This model based on a linear and progressive view of history favored divesting people of private properties and possessions and truly their autonomy. George Orwell captured this theme in his famous book 1984. Economic wealth, it is thought, will be best produced by state regulated and state dictated, but seemingly as practice in communist regimes is now a matter of history. This model will not work for a free citizenship. We are now firmly entrenched in an age of constitutionalism. Each sovereign state swears to rule itself by constitutional arrangement. No constitutional arrangement is complete without emphasis on fundamental freedoms and human autonomy. The function of democracy is best answered by the extent to which and the manner in which the state and governance practices fundamental freedom. One can as well end the dialogue here, but given the human condition and the roads which are yet to be laid towards taming two formidable aspects of human nature, namely violence and intolerance, and the propensity to exclude others from sharing the benefits of the commonly generated wealth of the community, several extra miles need to be traveled. The Constitution does matter. It matters because it makes two things possible, namely both governance and citizenship. The highest value of citizenship is the capacity to be free as an individual and the willingness to be responsible as a shared member of the community. It is a natural selection process and the richly coded DNA which contributes to the individual existence. It is these rich endowments which grant us the profound opportunities to be creative and to be able to create conditions of freedom from want and pain. The highest value of governance is the ability to value freedom and blend it with a freedom for all where all those negative indicia of an unequal society would have been replaced by more humane scales of measurement of all human worth. In contemporary times, in the human rights dialogue, three key words have been in good circulation, namely protect, regard, and respect. When governance protects, regards, and respects the values of autonomy and freedom, and when citizens protect, regard, and respect such values inherent in all living creatures, then we would have had the common highway to be jointly traveled by governance and citizens. From converting governance as it exists today as a unilateral corridor of power and authority into a participatory platform will be the aspiration. All these may seem to be well-intentioned theorizing. It may be true to some extent. The constitutional order itself demands from all of us the courage and conviction to stand up and defy the constitutional order when they fail, to protest the illegitimate constitutional choices which visit the less fortunate of our brethren with pain, loss, and lack of humanity, to stand up and raise our voices against the aberrations of an open society, or the ever-waiting attempts to close the gates in an open society. When citizenship fully prevails upon governance, the dichotomy between governance, which is hostile, 
and her, and her citizenship, which is tamed, disappears. In a manner of speaking, some of these values are finally reflected in Part 4 of the Constitution, namely fundamental duties. I venture to say that the domain of fundamental duties is not to be confined to the much attacked morality realm. The seemingly false dichotomy between duties and freedom have to be necessarily dissolved, and so we have an open society, the call of respecting and regarding governance, individuals with their freedoms merge in shades of responsibilities, producing institutions which act as mut mutual limitations, all in the end to ensure once again what we notice is the highest order of citizenship. Look at what happens when an injured portion of a body is all set to regenerate itself. Imagine you were an unlucky enough to get a paper cut. The response that the incision triggers is called slices through the outermost surface of your skin, cells embedded, cells embedded through your flesh called nociceptors spark into action. After an hour, the majority of the cells attending the paper cut are called neutrophils. These carry detectors on their membranes that pick up the chemical emergen emergency signals pulsating out from the ground zero and move in the direct of the strongest of them. On, ar on arrival, neutrophils act as a specialist cleaners enveloping bacteria and hovering up debris and debritus before killing themselves when their task is complete. Over the next 24 hours, another regiment of cells files into the site and each matures into the grand Pac-Man of the immune system, the macrophage. These chomp up the neutrophil carcasses and any other potentially damaging remains they find. Critically, the cut itself isn't simply stuck back together. Otherwise, we would lose the sensitivity that was there before the injury. Nor is simply a case of plugging the gap with the new skin cells. Otherwise, we would be lumpy and malformed. Our bodies strive to make repairs as invisible as possible and to restore the body to its pre-injury state. It will need to be patched up with new flesh, which is a complex collaboration of cells. And that means the birth of a tissue. If the wonderful cell of a human body can achieve this miraculous regeneration, what stops the evolved human mind from realizing greater goals through validational plurality. Neuroscientists talk about the old brain and the neocortex and the roles in human life. A new peep into these parts of the brain tells us that the functions of these uh, two are integrated. The divisions will be close to reality or will be functional classification like the old Freudian classifications of the mind. We may compare the old brain with its function in preserving the species and evolution at our past citizenship domain, the enigmatic neocortex which creates this world model for future and current and daily work can be called as our current citizenship terrain, both working in seamless connection. Before I conclude with the last part of this uh, statement, uh, a perfect uh, legal constitution, and this is not part of the printed speech, is a last minute uh, uh, idea which flashed yesterday night and uh, let me share it with you. A perfect legal constitution is not a textbook or a prayer book to be simply recited. Perfect can, perfection connotes not what is but what ought to be. This ought to be the problematic and contested world of thoughts and actions. Brother Nayag Upanishad says, Atmanastu Kamaya Sarvam Priyam Bhavati, meaning that all yearnings are grounded for the sake of the self. Yearnings of each one of us are the products of our gunas and the social order we have created. It's a circle, and we collide with each other in the course of our yearnings. This field of clashes between individuals as a social phenomena is identified by dharma, and we are told to liberate ourselves by pursuit of both pravritti, uh, pravritti mark and nivritti mark. Can these paths of liberation enter into the citizenship canvas? Since there are no universal thoughts or universally accepted or common beliefs and standards or rules of conduct in everything about our lives, and so about the Constitution, we enter into debates on morality and law, that perennial debate on what should ultimately govern us.
asked by Arjuna, after doing away our Svajanam, that is our kindred, how can I live in happiness? We will debate and decide on rights, law and justice, through commonly designed platforms, though today technology seems to deceive us with its allurements. We will debate and so desire on peace and compassion, altruism and deceit, and keep making dictionaries of life where dharma and the constitution could have entered into a compact beyond nihilism, dialectical materialism, and anarchism clothed in respectable sociological attires. In other words, the fusion of the world of dharma and the world of the constitution is like the ideal coordination between the As it becomes more developed, more enlightenment, as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered, and manners and opinions change, with the change of circumstances, institution must advance also to keep pace with the times. I mean, no doubt that the dharmic citizenship informed by non-injurious perseveration, global commons, equal regard for all and equal worth of all, will create and shape our institutions, our life on planet Earth. The light in this path, I hope, will emanate from Indian soil, that it will be set the homo sapiens moved away from being the architect of their own demise. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at the shape of uh, the Indian constitution, its democratic uh, evolution, and the role of the courts and its important dimensions, uh, and so on and so forth. And as a student of law, since Justice Rabindran is here, I also think, keep thinking that, uh, and many uh, venerable learned judges being here, I think there's a time for a, a new theory on courts, a new theory on courts beyond our understanding of common law traditions of courts. And what this new theory of courts will do, I think it will blend with the concerns of citizenship. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. I think he needs a standing ovation for this wonderful lecture, <laughs> a fantastic lecture. And uh, we have no adequate words to thank him. I think uh, claps could be could louder, I suppose. Uh, he has done a fantastic job of a Munshi Memorial Lecture. And uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And please be seated. We will take a few questions. Maybe uh, four or five, uh, because depending on the time that is available. Can the mic turn quickly? Or the understanding has. So you, you, you can come over here. You t you come and stay. Introduce yourself briefly in one word and uh, he would uh, answer. Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, please introduce yourself and uh, Sir, Namaste. Yeah. I'm Loke from uh, Onde Bharatam Foundation. It's a secured company. Mike, Ma uh, take, take the mic to your Make it fast. Sir, Namaste. I'm Lokesh from uh, Vande Bharatam Foundation. Uh, we are working on a concept called uh, Micro Governance in Real Time 24 by 7. Thanks to your uh, references, sir, each and every page I can see a reference to good governance. My today's takeaway is uh, new dimension of uh, Indian citizenship should end up in good governance. My only humble request to August uh, judges, legal immunities, we are passing the code of election code of conduct. Only during election code of conduct we visible more governance. Uh, why can't attempt be made? <laughs> Would governance be a part of the, I mean, everyday affair in the country apart from elections, sir? Thank you.
So I, I think uh, only when matters go to court, we talk about administration of justice. So as long as they don't go to the court, things are fine. So you're right in one sense that uh, the entire fabric of good governance is not a matter to be confined to the din and noise of the electoral period. Certainly true. But the test of it is what happens when elections take place. So when elections take place in a peaceful way, I suppose the tone is set for a peaceful governance. And elections do not take place in a peaceful way, the tone is certainly nuts for good governance. Does not mean independent of the din and noise of electoral scene, they need not be good governance. The two are independently, entirely independent, but they also have a, an organic symbiotic uh, relationship. So I don't think uh, any lawyer or a judge would say that uh, good governance uh, need to be only seen from the narrow focus lenses of a electoral, uh, you know, scene. It's certainly beyond that. But uh, they said that the tone is set. It's like a litmus test. When I argued uh, the election commission matter before the Supreme Court, very uh, intricate and uh, troubling questions were thrown at me. And of course, um, they were very important questions that the court wanted to uh, resolve, whether the court should have resolved them or not, is a different issue altogether. But I understood the importance of the questions coming from the court as a uh, the final arbiter of people's will and uh, transforming constitution into a dynamic, uh, you know, in, you know, organic instrument. Therefore, governance, uh, good governance, is not something which uh, we have borrowed from human rights dialogues. Uh, that's what those illustrations which I gave about the stories. Uh, the king unconsciously thinks they have done something unconsciously wrong. It's about good governance. So it's uh, it's a it's something which runs deep in in, in our ways of life, but because we have other innate conflicts in our social order, and uh, there is now a good disconnect between transformation into a higher levels of a constitutional governance and our inability to transform or translate all those constitutional aspirations and values into reality. And that is where politics, that is where uh, the uh, claims for equality and equal worth have no uh, hitherto evolved accepted field of resolution. And I think it's going to be like that for some more time to come. And um, Dalton himself uh, had talked about uh, how communist China is a, a completely a different example. I keep asking students when I go to lectures in law, law school, would you like to be live in a communist China? You talk about uh, the happenings in our country. Like a strike here, a strike there, and somebody protesting what I may call the, the fringe elements of a community. The fringe elements of a community are always there in every religion, every faith. Every religion, every faith is a fringe element, which would like to become the effervescent part of that religion or faith. So whatever they do need not necessarily be the, the rest of the community's you know, uh, reflections and what should be done. Therefore, today we have on the one hand a complete you know, dichotomy between what's happening in communist China and uh, the aspirations of peoples of China towards, you know, democracy and rule of law and the defects and deficiencies of rule of law elsewhere. That's very interesting. I think we should march along with it. And that's where good governance will make a good, uh, you know, platform for debate. Uh, thank you, sir. I think but it takes you to the dining area, right? So I don't think I have to make another announcement about it. So next question, Mr. Mel, make it brief, please. Why are you even telling 
why do we have a debt parliament in India and why we are inactive citizens in India? I don't think uh, we have an inactive parliament or an uh, exactive active citizenship or vice versa. The very fact that the fabric of our everyday life we meet like this, we discuss and debate like this, and we're able to share our very, what's called, I, I remember uh, an expression. I, I think, well, as I said, to talk about the pride of India, Bharatiya Vidya, I'm not talking from any hegemonical point of view. I'm talking from the point of view of trying to be, trying to understand the past for whatever it is relevant and worth today, and to be able to take the best of the past and to fuse it into the future. And that's where citizenship lies. So I, I don't think uh, governance of parliament is inactive, but it can be made inactive by us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Last question. I think uh, anyone here? I think uh, yes, sir. Just just a moment. Uh, the mic will come to you. Uh, or, you or you can come over here. Please introduce yourself. In C come over here, sir. Please. Yeah, if you are audible, fine. This is a very important question, asking not merely as a lawyer, but as a human being. That's why I started saying that uh, we can have theories of science and equations in mathematics. Uh, but if you say that the best equation that works is the best, is also a problematic uh, statement. Because for more than 40, 50 years, people in Soviet Russia thought that was the best equation, but it did not work. So also it's happening in communist China. Is it the best equation? So in a, in a free democratic rule of law country as we call ourselves, the fundamental clash today, I think, is a, is a challenge. He is between human beings, all of us, being free with our ability to create, be innovative, and contribute to our individual and collective fulfillment. That is important. And at the same time, equality. But today we are not able to still answer, resolve the claims of equality of all human beings. Because we have created an unequal society, whether through a communist order or through any other order. We have created an unequal society which uh, runs through all aspects of our life. Whether in, I, I look at the kind of uh, a footwear I, I buy. I go to a shop where I'll buy a footwear where I can afford to buy a footwear. Somebody will go to a shop, uh, for instance, who can afford to buy a footwear of 100 rupees, I may purchase a footwear of 1,000 rupees. So footwear, to suit face, to the dress we wear, are all made to suit the unequal demands and claims of each and every one of us. That's where the economy, the economical order. So much so, Piketty, the French uh, you know, economist, one of his recent books is about moving backwards towards socialism. I am I'm not clear whether that's going to be a solution. And uh, we cannot redefine, unless we redefine socialism as a merger of all these post-1948 developments in political science and political thinking and human rights dialogue, 
Well, that calls for a highly evolved global understanding and compact. So we have conflicts on the economic, global economic trends. We have conflicts on still on some country other wanting to be a leader of the world. Some country wanting to be, you know, at the helm of affairs and dictate the economic and social and political project to the rest of the world. As long as this continues, I think the national identities, nationhood, importance of our cultures, etc., will be will be paramount of paramount importance. So, I am not sure whether we we can have any any set of theoreticians working in a classroom with a blackboard and, and a chalk on your hands to say that here, like great Ramanujam, I work the equations for a gold piece and order. And uh, look at what happened to the human rights dialogues and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. It could have remained like the rest of the constitutions in other parts of the world as the only solitary document on human rights, but it did not. Now you have hundreds and hundreds of conventions and covenants, and then, you know, it's every, every third day, we need a commentary on what we said in 1948, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So that's, that's where the, the, the innate conflicts in human nature, et cetera, and uh, I, I think fundamentally, we are still not tuned to the eyes. You can never be a good lawyer. And uh, therefore, when I say good lawyer, it means using law, being with law, participating with law. We, we exclude everybody who, who has a role to play in law. Therefore, I, I, this is a challenge, and, uh, but we must live with the challenge and produce as good answers, as close to reality as one can visualize as possible. And that's where I think we keep telling ourselves that yes, we have moved one more inch towards perfection. And perfection need not necessarily be a, a, a what's called the illusory deer which uh, Lakshmana went in search of. It can be certainly a deer which you can, you know, one day capture before all other imagination. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think uh, with this, uh, we close the questions. Sir. In case you have any specific questions, please email to Bharti Vidya Bhavan. Address. Welcome, Ravindran Sir. Mr. Venkat Ramani, Attorney General of India. Mr. Raghavan, President Bharti Vidya Bhavan. Judges, past and present, lawyers, friends. It's a great pleasure to preside over Dr. K. M. Munshi Memorial Lecture event organized by the Bharti Vidya Bhavan and Dr. K. M. Munshi Institute for Good Governance. The pleasure becomes an honor when the memorial lecture is by Mr. Venkatramani, the respected Attorney General of India. Dr. Munshi was a great visionary and a brilliant and versatile Indian. He was a leading lawyer, a nationalist, a freedom fighter, a member of the Constituent Assembly who contributed to the drafting of the Constitution, a minister, a governor, man of literature, and novelist. One of his most significant contributions to the country is the creation of Bharti Vidya Bhavan, which strives to preserve, propagate, and nurture Bharatiya Sanskriti, that is Indian culture. The Bhavan has more than 300 centers and is rendering yeoman service to the country by inculcating a value-based life to the citizens of this great nation. Mr. Ramani, Venkat Ramani, who presently adorns the office of Advocate General of, Attorney General of India, is a lawyer, poet, philosopher, and author. His interests and expertise are varied from constitutional law to spiritual law. He is known for his
to the country and its citizens. Citizenship has different facets and dimensions, legal, constitutional, social, economic, and political. In today's lecture, Mr. Venkatramani has developed and explained yet another dimension, that is dharmic citizenship, which in a sense reflects the ethos of the Bhavan. The term citizenship is understood as referring to two aspects. The first refers to the right to be a citizen, that is, who is a citizen and who can become a citizen. The second refers to the rights and responsibilities of citizen. Today's lecture is not about the first aspect as to who can be citizen. It is not therefore about immigrants, not therefore about refugees, legal or illegal, from neighboring countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. Nor is it about Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 or the National Register of Citizens or the role of Aadhaar. The lecture is about the second aspect, that is the interplay between rights and responsibilities of citizen. Perceptions can vary about citizenship depending upon the philosophy of the person considering it. A conservative may look at it differently from a liberal. A democrat may look at it differently from a communist or a socialist. A person belonging to a minority may look at differently from a person belonging to the majority. But ultimately, defining citizenship is a political activity. In his uh, illuminating lecture today, Mr. Venkatramani has traced the concept of citizenship from the days of Plato and Aristotle and then proceeds to paint by broad strokes a picture of citizenship based on dharmic principles. Mr. Venkatramani recommends a citizenship which by blending certain moral and philosophical aspects to constitutional ideas can serve and benefit the present and future generations of humanity. Aristotle's notion In those days, slaves from citizenship. Though this may shock our conscience, it may have made sense in the context of, a, of Greek city-states in an era three centuries before the birth of Christ. Christ. 25 centuries those who are born in India or whose parents were born in India or who were ordinarily resident in territory of India five years preceding the commencement of the constitution are considered to be citizens of India. Article 11 of the constitution empowers the parliament to make laws with respect to acquisition and termination of citizenship and other matters relating to citizenship. of rights of citizens may relate to individual freedom, that is freedom of speech. Citizens' rights may relate to social and economic political philosophy, these rights may differ. The duties may also be differ. 
it may be as stated in Article 51A in India, or in, in some countries there may be other duties and responsibilities like conscription, that is compulsory enlistment in armed forces or state services. Mr. Venkatramani's vision endeavors to add dharmic values to the legal and constitutional framework of citizenship. He canvasses the removal of false dichotomies self-discipline and other dharmic virtues by citizens will remove the need to enumerate freedom, rights, duties, and obligations. He hopes that, the follow, uh, the, that following and adopting such dharmic values and principles as new dimensions of citizenship will make humans a better race and the world a better place to live. The move to dharmic citizenship, he believes, will save humanity from its own greed, devotery, intolerance, and other. While listening to him today, uh, I just remembered something associated with citizenship. That is a statement by Mr. Jay Shankar in the Rajya Sabha in answer to a question some time ago. He said that about two lakhs of Indians are renouncing Indian citizenship every year. And that in the last decade, nearly 17 lakhs Indians have acquired citizenship of other countries. In fact, countries educated people. Why in a country like ours, a democracy, where dharmic values are practiced or at least supposed to be practiced, why are they such large numbers opting to renounce Indian citizenship? Is it for political reasons? Is it for better employment opportunities? Or is it to improve their standard of living or quality of life? Or is it for purely financial gain? It is. Uh, Paper, a worrying feature. Perhaps it can be the subject for another illuminating lecture by Mr. Venkatramani in the days to come. I thank the office bearers of the Bhavan and its directors for organizing a wonderful and thought provoking lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. His lecture also deserves a standing ovation. I think this is something that he has. Uh, <coughs> you have set uh, already a stage for to well uh, I think time is exactly ready for the lunch. So our grateful thanks to Attorney General of India, Sri R. Venkatramani, sir, kindly accept our sincere and we have no adequate words to thank you for your presence and Madam Venkatramani, Madam, thank you so much and we have all the people here uh, who are all your fans, so kindly accept our gratitude and uh, thanks to you. And uh, to Justice R. V. Ravindran, sir, thank you so much 
for your presence and the wonderful. I think you have really, you know, set next subject very clearly and thought provoking your speech. Namaste and thank you on behalf of all the, our people present here on this occasion. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and to our Raghavan, who is the man who is the reason for this today's program. I think we should give a good round of applause to him. <laughs> His uh, opening remarks and the introduction of the chief guest and everything and his planning and because of him today we were able to present this uh, lecture. And thank you Raghavan sir, kindly uh, plan such uh, lectures which is thought provoking and also necessary for the country. And uh, our thanks to goes to all of you who have been made it possible to come this morning and uh, spend time with us. Kindly have a good lunch. And as I told earlier, follow the red carpet. It will lead to the dining hall. Please have your lunch and then let's uh, depart. And our thanks also goes to the people who have helped us with Purna Kumbha Swagatam, Gunjanata Shastri, Subramanian Sharma, and also the live coverage today, the whole program has gone on live. And the media persons were also here to take uh, care of the media requirements. And thanks to my, our Kendra committee members and all of you, and each one of you, I don't want to name any specifically. Thank you very much, and we will adjourn for lunch. Thank you one and all.